Now I'd like to introduce Lois Montorio, who's going to introduce our speaker. And Lois was the one responsible for uh, securing this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Lois. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to have such a wonderful turnout for such an important topic. I know at first you all thought emotional issues and a teenage girl. Hmm. <laughs> Does it really happen? <laughs> I also would like to thank Valerie Nelson, who has brought this speaker series as a wonderful service to you, our parent community. So thank you so much, Valerie. And I'm happy to tell you just a little bit of the guest. I'm happy to tell you a little bit about our guest speaker. Now, from my vantage point as Director of Alumni Relations, the most important fact that you need to know about Dr. Kathleen McCoy is that she is a proud alum from the class of 1963. Yeah. It's great to welcome you back to campus, Kathy. And as Sister Carolyn, as you all know, tells us quite often, you never really leave the hill. So Kathy, <laughs> it's true. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my face. Uh, so <laughs> Kathy is a, an award-winning author of nearly a dozen books. One of her books, uh, The Teenage Body Book, which was revised in 2008 and published by Random House, was awarded the American Library Association's Best Book for Young Adults. She's been a frequent guest on television shows, including The Today Show, twice on Oprah, okay, <laughs> twice on Oprah, Geraldo, Charlie Rose, for those of you of my age, Sally Jesse Rathbun. <laughs> <laughs> she's written, I'll tell the rest of you about it later. Uh, she's written articles for many national magazines, newspapers, including Red Book, Reader's Digest, The New York Times, a favorite of mine, sorry, uh, Women's Day, Ladies Home Journal, uh, Mademoiselle. She is here today with her husband, Bob Stover. They drove in last night from Arizona just to be here with us today. Uh, they'll be leaving later this afternoon uh, to go back. And I have to tell you, it's just my honor to introduce to you Dr. Kathleen McCoy. something today about a, a young student talking about feeling such anxiety that she might be taking anti-anxiety medication. So that certainly is a very pervasive problem today. Other studies have found that 14% of young people will have an episode of major depression before their 15th birthday. Uh, a recent study uh, reported in the Wall Street Journal just last week said that uh, 8 million 588 children and adolescents between the ages of 10 and 19 are currently taking antidepressants. And a 2002 Brown University study found that parents often don't recognize the signs of adolescent depression. Even when the parents have good communication with their kids, 
Now that's scary. And it's really true. Uh, a lot of my own interest, initially at least in adolescent depression, came about because I have a younger sister who's 10 years younger than I am. And she went through a life-changing bout of adolescent depression when she was 14 years old. She'd been an excellent student at St. Bede's. We grew up in La Cunada. And she was an A student. She was a very talented ballet dancer. She had friends. She got along with everyone in the family. She was the much adored baby of the family. And she was just an overall <coughs> delightful person. And she uh, started changing her freshman year of high school. And she had the bad judgment not to come here. She decided she had enough of Catholic school and she went to walking out of high school. And she started showing signs of just a lot of irritability and anger. And we couldn't talk to her about it. She just kind of shut everybody out. She paced a lot at night, didn't sleep, um, started not wanting to go to school. And she said it, it wasn't anything to do with school. She just didn't like to get up in the morning. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And so my parents were saying, well, you know, she's going through a lot of hormonal changes. She's 13. She's making the shift from grade school to high school. And those are all very true statements. Kids can have difficulties with that transition to high school. Grades may slip a little bit. They may have a lot of anxiety. Um, maybe going from a very familiar grade school um, to a uh, high school, that can be a very tough transition. So uh, my parents were correct in assuming, at least initially, that it might be the transition to a much larger school that was the, the difficulty. But she quit ballet lessons. Uh, she started uh, skipping school altogether. Um, she was just continually truant and ended up <coughs> dropping out of school and just really talking about how she felt hopeless and she wanted to die. And at that point, I was like, hmm, maybe we ought to see somebody. So uh, she started getting professional help about a year into her depression. And um, the help, you know, certainly was life saving. But there were some consequences of her actions. She never did go back to high school. She got her GED when she was 40, after years of underemployment and two failed marriages. And at the age of 40, she had kind of an epiphany um, that she'd had a health issue that uh, made her realize this was not a dress rehearsal. She also had a young child. And she said, you know, I can't live in my car with a two-year-old. And so she got her GED, she went to community college, she went into a nursing program, she's now an RN, and she's a supervisor in charge of labor and delivery for a large hospital in Seattle, and she's doing wonderfully. But she looks back with great regret on all the lost years, and also the fact that our parents didn't live to see her blossom in middle age. So, um, the, so I think that's probably an extreme case, but the consequences of not recognizing trouble early on can be devastating at times. Early detection is critical for a teenage depression. Now, in order to uh, recognize teenage depression, it's so tough because kids are moody and you know, they're going through so many changes, but I think in order to recognize depression, if it exists in your own daughter, is to first of all know what the risk factors are for depression. To know the difference between teenage and adult depression, because they can look very different. Uh, know the difference between normal, moody teenage behavior and depression. And then finally, to know and be able to identify the symptoms of teenage depression. And so that's going to be the thrust of my talk today. We'll have a little tutorial on this. Um, the risk factors for depression, there are quite a few of them. One of them is family stress, which would include also uh, parental depression. And we don't always know whether um, parental depression may be catching and to live with a depressed person. In some instances, there may be a genetic component with um, bipolar be a genetic uh, component to that. And so, um, also, um, 
teenagers who are growing up in a um, chaotic family situation, chaotic, being depressed in a situation. I had a patient once, a 14-year-old boy, who came to me and he was obviously depressed, but he said to me when he got into therapy, you know, I don't mind being here and I think maybe this is useful for me, but you know, you want to know who's really crazy? It's my parents. And, <laughs> you know, in this instance, he was absolutely right. <laughs> his father was diabetic, he was an out of control diabetic, and he had three kidney transplants, and he wouldn't take his anti rejection medication, so he had failed transplants. His wife was totally disgusted with him, wouldn't have anything to do with him. He kept trying to commit suicide, and his son was a designated caregiver, and he was trying to keep all of this going. And while he was in therapy, his father died, and so we dealt with you know, the fact that he did the best he could by his father. And, but in this instance, you know, it was really true. Probably one of the only instances I've seen where I think the parents really needed therapy for the kid. Um, also, I think some teenagers uh, coming from families where there are high expectations can get depressed because they so fear disappointing their parents. I've seen this in therapy so much where, um, you know, obviously, I mean, we all want the best for our kids. We want them to do well at school and go to a good college and have wonderful careers and maybe more important happy lives. And it's you know, I think all this is certainly doable, and you certainly have a giant step ahead you know, by sending your daughters to this wonderful school. But uh, sometimes kids, if they have a setback that maybe you don't think is so terrible, they may think is, is just awful because they're so afraid of not being the best, so afraid of disappointing you, and so they can get depressed or very anxious because of that. Um, also, some kids with chronic illnesses like diabetes um, or epilepsy may have some depression because they feel different from their peers. They may not be able to drive. They may, if they have epilepsy, they may need to keep to a different meal schedule or, or eat different foods than their peers eat. Also, with epilepsy, particularly temporal lobe epilepsy, interrectal behavior syndrome can be a real factor in that. And, Depression is a huge part of interrectal syndrome and temporal lobe epilepsy. And so that's something that isn't talked about a lot, but it's very important to know if you're the parent of a child with temporal lobe. Um, also, of course, and this is probably what for most of us comes to mind when we think of a teenager becoming depressed, rejection by peers or isolation from peers can be a huge factor in depression, particularly if a child um, is bullied and um, whether face-to-face -face or cyberbullying, that's a huge problem. And growing up female, interestingly enough, puts girls um, much more at risk of depression. And it's often thought that one of the factors in this might be that when a girl has a failure or a setback, She'll attribute this to a lack of ability. I can't do it. If a boy has a similar setback, they're more likely to attribute it to lack of effort. And so they don't really see themselves as lacking. It's just, well, if I tried, I could have done that. And um, another uh, learning disabilities could certainly be uh, a factor in depression, particularly if the teenager is very aware of maybe not being able to keep up with peers. Uh, and not the least, significant losses can loom large, and this would include a death, certainly uh, in the family uh, or of a, a friend, a relative um, who was much loved. It might be a parental divorce um, or marital problems. It might be uh, the loss of a pet, interestingly enough. Uh, when my sister um, got depressed, um, a real triggering factor was the loss of her 13-year-old cat, Edith, who had been a constant companion for her since babyhood. And so I think we can't minimize the impact that the loss of the pet might have on um, certain kids. And sexual orientation can also be a major factor. It's been found that gay and lesbian teenagers are much more prone to de uh, depression and also um, three times more likely to attempt 
or uh, to or actually commit suicide mm -hmm. than their straight peers. Now, one of the challenges, you know, we talk about uh, these things, but the, one of the challenges is um, identifying, thank you so much, the symptoms of teenage depression. How to tell it from adult depression, because, you know, when we talk about depression, we quite often think about, well, somebody's kind of sad and moving around and lethargic, and that can pretty well describe adult depression. But teenagers have a very different way sometimes of expressing <coughs> depression. They may be angry, they may be irritable. Irritability is a huge part of uh, adolescent depression. Um, they may act out in any number of ways, from getting in trouble at school to um, experimenting with drugs or alcohol, um, or just plain oppositional behavior constantly. Um, teenagers also elicit a different response to depression because a depressed adult who looks depressed as we might define it um, would quite often elicit um, sympathy or empathy but an acting out teen you know at least initially uh, might get punished for bad behavior and you wouldn't see the depressive component in the behavior. Uh, teenage depression can also be very intense because well, I think hormones and all the physical changes they're going through, particularly in early adolescence, um, is here. But also, um, and their brains are developing cognitively still. And I think that's something we forget because kids today are so darn smart. And they're so knowledgeable in so many ways. And you know, technologically, um, as far as my generation is concerned, they're all geniuses. But, um, <laughs> You know, we often forget that they're still developing um, in their brains, and so they may process events and information in a very different way than adults do. And also, the lack of life experience. You know, they don't know if they lose a love or are separated from them. They don't know that either the love can survive or if it doesn't, it'll be okay because they'll grow on and maybe meet somebody else who um, may be even better, but they don't want to hear that at 17, necessarily. Um, and teenage depression, you know, again, is often minimized by adults, not through any bad intent or anything, but, you know, we have a different perspective. We can look at a young person and say, my gosh, you have your whole life ahead of you, you're so beautiful, you're so smart, you're so gifted, how could you be depressed? And so, and we'll talk in a little bit about seeing the world from their perspective. But from our perspective, sometimes it's really hard to accept that depression is a possibility. And another factor is that the <coughs> acting out behavior of adolescents can have some life-changing aspects, as they did with my sister. Uh, certainly not going to school or dropping out of school if somebody gets pregnant and has a baby. I mean, that really is a life-changer. And so are problems with the law all kinds of things like that uh, can really have an impact on their lives for some years to come. And so one hopes that the acting out behavior doesn't ever get serious enough and you know, that uh, the symptoms are caught soon enough so that the um, acting out behavior doesn't become life changing. Um, the next challenge is how do you tell a depressed, an irritable, angry, depressed teenager from an irritable, angry, normal, moody teenager. You know, sometimes it's really tough. And I think the difference would be that there are two factors involved that you want to look for. The first is frequency and intensity. Um, you know, for average, non-depressed teenager who's just going through those hormonal shifts and that angry stage is going to be angry and oppositional sometimes, and their sweet selves the other times. There are times in between where you can enjoy each other and life seems to be back to normal and then you have a conflict or, you know, they might have times of anger and times of wanting to walk behind you in the mall or not wanting to sit with you in the movies. That's all normal <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny, I, I wrote an article for um, Family Circle some years ago called When You Get 
when others get the best and you get the worst of your teenager. And I <laughs> talked to some parents about it before and saying that, to, you know, everybody's saying your daughter is so wonderful. And I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> 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 so that amazing? And uh, I, I know a, a, a friend of mine who I interviewed before that, and he said, yeah, Abby, it's like she, she puts on this song book when she comes in the door, you know, see her coming up the walk and she's all happy in the gym. <laughs> oh my gosh. But that's normal moody adolescence. But if the irritability and the anger just don't stop, if it's just constant rather than intermittent, then there may well be a problem with depression. And also, another way to gauge whether there's a problem or not is to say, you know, is this a drastic change in behavior for my daughter? Um, it's not uncommon for kids making a transition <coughs> uh, to high school or certainly to college to have a little bit of a bobble in grades to maybe if they've been an A student to make some B's you know, while they're making that adjustment. But if an A student suddenly starts making D's or failing classes, that's a red flag. Then you've got a problem because um, that just isn't going to happen with a normal kind of kid struggling with the transition to school. Now the symptoms of adolescent depression, uh, we've talked about them a little bit here. The first would be dysphoric moods, that's irritability, anger, anxiety, expressed hopelessness, and uh, this can all indicate depression. Uh, with a major depression, the teenager will be irritable most days, every day, for at least two weeks. For a teenager with dysthymia, which is kind of considered chronic depression, they will have a depressed mood or irritability most of the day, every day, for the minimum of one year. And it's interesting because sometimes people think, ooh, major depression is much worse than dysthymia. And actually, they're both a challenge because dysthymia, the, the chronic depression, can just wear you down. It can wear your teenager down, can wear you down. So uh, both of them are um, conditions that you would need to get some help for. Um, you would also want to look for changes in eating and sleeping habits. If your teenager is eating a lot less, has lost interest in food, uh, or is starting to overeat, compulsively um, and gaining weight, that can be a red flag for depression. Also insomnia, uncharacteristic early awakening, um, sleep all <coughs> day and staying up all night, those are all possible symptoms of depression. Social isolation is a red flag, you know their friends are so important to them and if they start withdrawing from the friends. They may have periods of withdrawing from family, and a little withdrawal from the family is, is part of the teenage agenda. But um, if they're very withdrawn from you, if they're also starting to withdraw from their friends, then that's a sign of trouble. Uh, we talked about acting out behavior. You know, it might even include you know, problems at school, but also things like shoplifting. They might have an episode of that. <coughs> that which would be very uncharacteristic. Hyperactivity, which would include restless pacing, getting into a frenzy of activity, um, being very nervous and anxious and unable to focus, uh, this can be a depressive sign. And also extreme <coughs> passivity if your teenager suddenly, you know, who's been very active, suddenly is watching TV all the time. Um, that can be another uh, sign of depression. And obviously, you don't look for one thing in isolation, but things in combination can indicate that there may be a problem. Um, accidents are also uh, quite often depressive components because the teenager is, uh, especially if she tends to be impulsive, she may be driving too fast or not being careful enough at skiing or skateboarding, and may be distracted by anxious or depressed thoughts and more likely to have an accident. So if your teenager becomes very accident prone, it's maybe time to start asking some questions. Now, suicidal talk and behavior is a giant red flag. And 
give its own uh, area of this talk, but if uh, your teenager starts talking about I think better off dead, or sometimes I wish I was dead, or sometimes I just, why do I go on living? Uh, that's huge. You really need to listen and to get professional help right away. Now, helping your depressed teen, and we're putting aside the suicidal depressed teenager, um, I think it's important, first of all, to communicate your observations, to say, I, I see you feeling so irritable all the time, or you seem to be unhappy at school, or you just don't seem to be sleeping well, and I'm very concerned, I want to help, and we're in this together, let's talk about this. Um, I think it's important to listen carefully to what your teenager says without trying to talk them out of it or uh, offering your own judgment or opinion uh, immediately, but just to, to let them talk or encourage them to talk. And sometimes that face-to-face, -face, and you probably are 10 steps ahead of me on this, but the face-to-face -face doesn't always work. You know, sometimes say, let's take a walk and take a walk with them and they're not looking at you can talk. It also works very well in a car. And uh, I remember one time that my stepdaughter, uh, when she was about 13, we uh, drove to the mall and we started talking in the car. We, had, we never made it into the mall. We just kept talking. But she wouldn't necessarily want to talk to me face to face if I said, um, let's talk. It was like, oh, I don't want to go there. But if it was while doing something else, she felt more comfortable. And that might be a way, particularly if your teenager is angry or um, seems irritable, uh, have that irritable depression, that might be a way to start the ball rolling conversationally. Also, empathize with your teen. Try to see the world from her perspective. These, despite all that you wish for, and you want these to be just absolutely wonderful years, these are probably not the best years of her life. And, you know, think back on your own high school experience. Were they the best years of your life, really? Um, you know, when you think back on all the insecurities and the hormonal changes and the social challenges and everything, uh, I think while many of us have good memories of high school, we also have memories of, you know, maybe things that weren't so comfortable. And so, also, and, and knowing that, you know, when you lose a first love, it just feels like a disaster. And um, there's a tendency to, you know, like, uh, well, you know, thank God, well, you know, didn't like him anyway. <laughs> Good ones. But, you know, for her, this is huge. It was a first love, and she thinks she will never love him like the same way again. And so seeing things from her perspective uh, can really help the communication uh, go forward. Also, um, I think it's important, and you're probably doing this already, but I just want to reinforce it with you, that uh, helping your daughter develop essential skills, like saying no, and it's not just no to drugs or no to sex too soon or things like that, although it certainly can include that, but no to peers who want to engage in behavior she's not comfortable. And no to maybe getting overextended with activities. You know, that can be a huge anxiety producer with kids. Um, you know, they're already so committed and so busy. And um, they need to be able to say no to putting too much on their plate. And so you can help them very much like that, maybe role play with them. Help them to say no to friends in a, a, a kind and loving way. And also, uh, I think it's important if your teenager is going through a rough time to praise their efforts at resolving their crisis. Not just the results, but the effort. And communicate love and caring in, in spoken words and little notes you may leave in their room or put under the door. Uh, or with a hug if you can get away with it. You know, in therapy we find that some of the breakthroughs come not when people confront each other about things. The, the tears and the breakthroughs come in family therapy when they start to express love to each other. It's really interesting to see how the mood and the mood changes. And so expressing love, even when your teenager is acting a bit unlovable at the moment, can really help. 
And I think the, the guideline is to help as much as you can and then be open to help from other people. And an excellent first resource would be your teen's physician. And unless the teen is suicidal, but if the teenager is just showing some signs that kind of have you uneasy, think he or she may be depressed, um, make a doctor's appointment. Some medical conditions like um, mononucleosis or anemia that might be caused by a bad diet, mm -hmm. uh, or as I mentioned, temporal lobe epilepsy, can have depressive components. So I think it's important to rule out any physical problems that may be present, that may be causing or contributing to the depression. And uh, so I think you know the physician can certainly help with that. And many physicians uh, who are pediatricians who are used to uh, dealing with teenagers or the pediatricians who are either in the <coughs> or um, uh, pediatricians who have special training in adolescent medicine often do a checklist with kids. You might have a private session with them, do a checklist, and just see how they're functioning in all areas of their lives and whether mental health help might be indicated. And um, so, and we'll talk about making the best use of mental health in a minute, but I wanted to backtrack a little bit to if you have a teenager who has expressed suicidal thoughts or uh, plans, uh, it's very important to take these seriously. You know, it's, if somebody says, oh, I wish I was dead, you might think that the first words that might come to mind be drama queen. And you know, that's, a, that's an understandable thing, and you know, one hears a lot of things, and you think, okay, okay. But, you know, if suicide is starting to be a theme, uh, it's important to pay attention. Suicide is the third leading cause of death between the ages of 16 and 24. And while white males are most likely to attempt uh, to succeed at suicide, white females are most likely to attempt. And um, many of the suicidal teenagers have had a severe depression, um, but the biggest danger for a suicide attempt is not while they're in the pit of a severe depression, but when they start to lift themselves out, when their mood improves a little bit. Because if you're in the pit, you just don't have the energy to do anything, including kill yourself. But when you start to feel a little better and your energy returns, you're still feeling really bad. But now you have the energy to make, make that happen. So it's important to really be aware of that. Um, teenagers who are more likely to commit suicide or to attempt suicide uh, are likely to be impulsive and to feel uh, isolated from their peers, thus the higher incidence of gay and lesbian uh, teenagers uh, being suicidal. And also, they're much more likely to have a substance abuse problem. A study at the University of Pittsburgh found that the, teen, uh, that the teens who commit suicide uh, tend to be about 10 times more likely to be drunk or on drugs at the time of the suicide. So major warnings of suicide, again, would be severe depression with some lift in mood, substance abuse, expressing feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, and total futility, um, withdrawing from family and friends, and then giving away prized possessions is a big red flag, and talking about suicide or death as a release. Um, you know, there's this, this frequent conviction that those who talk about suicide don't do it, and that's not right. I think that many times there have been signs, and they talk, <coughs> they talk about it, and they might not talk to you, they might talk to their friends, and that's why those of us in mental health are so wanting to speak in schools and educate students that sometimes the most loving thing you can do for a friend is to tell somebody, tell a teacher, tell a school counselor, tell somebody who's an adult who can do something to help. Because many times they don't want to uh, rat out their friends. But in this case, um, this is a time when you do have to say something. Certainly, therapists and teachers are, are mandated to um, break confidentiality in the case of uh, somebody who's a danger to herself or him. 
So uh, I think with uh, if your teenager is showing signs of a possible suicidal crisis, a take this seriously, and then b go directly to a mental health professional. Don't do the doctor's visit first. You might get a referral from your doctor, but go directly to a mental health professional or call the suicide prevention hotline and get a referral. Uh, suicidal teens don't do well with multiple layers of referrals, you know, because they feel like if they go to one person and they refer them to another, it's like, oh, nobody can help me. This really is hopeless. Um, so know also that, uh, so get them to the first available qualified <coughs> mental health professional. We'll talk about that in a minute. And also know that hospitalization may be necessary if it's deemed that your teenager is definitely a danger to herself. In general, um, and this would be, a, you know, a general comments about professional help, and this would apply to not only suicidal teenagers, but um, depressed, generally depressed teenagers as well. Uh, a good therapist, how do you find a good therapist? Um, a good therapist will listen well. A good therapist does not take sides. They try to empower the communication between you and your teenager if you're getting family therapy. Uh, a good therapist is professional, caring, non-judgmental. And also, a good therapist is conservative in terms of uh, the predicting the outcome of therapy. Because there's so many variables, including the motivation of the people in therapy. So if you come across somebody who said, bring the teenager to me, I will fix them in three sessions. Run. Do not let your teenager hear that person. Because you just can't make that prediction. And in the sense, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular therapist in the 90s who used to practice down in Cerritos. And he used to have these ads in the paper and do these information sessions where he'd say, I'll fix your teenager in three sessions. Well, yeah. He uh, would take the teenager and do three sessions, and then he'd hospitalize them whether they needed it or not. He had a special deal with the psychiatric hospital. So um, there aren't a lot of charlatans who have who are clearly licensed and everything, but you do want to really be aware that this is your child. So um, I think that um, uh, asking for help can be hard. You know, you feel embarrassed, you might feel like a bad parent because your child has problems. I remember interviewing a mother for my book uh, on teenage depression, mm -hmm. whose daughter had had cancer, and she'd had a four-year battle with cancer as a child, and she recovered fully only to experience a major depression when she was about 16. And the mother was telling me, you know, this probably sounds bizarre, but dealing <coughs> with life when my daughter had cancer was much easier because we knew that if she had chemotherapy treatment on Friday, she'd feel better on Tuesday, and that the general prognosis, even though the treatment was long and arduous, uh, was good. But when she was depressed and not going to school and talking about suicide, I, you know, I don't care what anybody says. I felt guilty. How, how can my daughter be this hopeless? What have I done? And so sometimes uh, you need to perhaps talk to somebody on your own about your own feelings about your teenager's difficulties. But please know that professional help is not about blame. But it's about helping your teenager to get in touch with their feelings, express these feelings in a, a way that will elicit more support, and help you and your team to reconnect with love. Now, um, when um, you get uh, a referral for a mental health professional, um, it may be from the doctor, it may be from a friend, or it may be from your insurance company. And this, this can be a good way to go because the insurance companies have panels and some of you who are professionals may be very aware of this and, and know what I'm talking about. It's very hard to get on a panel for an insurance company. It's hard to stay on a panel because they look very much at your education and credentials and also um, they look at your track record with patients. They do a lot of paperwork. You have to submit paperwork on progress, they sometimes want testing and assessment of a patient, 
six weeks into therapy, two months into therapy. So uh, there's accountability. And obviously, if somebody isn't working professionally or working effectively, they are not on the panel. So that can be a, a, a very good way to go. Another thing that you can do, if you get some names for referral and you don't know where to start, obviously, if your teen's in real trouble, you call them the first one that can see you is the one you go to, at least initially. But you can also go online. Uh, the uh, uh, therapists, you know, of course, there are psychiatrists who prescribe medications. Uh, sometimes they do therapy, but most often not. Uh, there are psychologists with PhDs who do therapy and also are very good with testing and assessment. And then there are also master levels therapists, uh, MFTs, marriage family therapists or um, LCSWs, licensed clinical social workers, who have experience working not only with individuals, but also with families and couples. And uh, you can go online to the Board of Behavioral Examiners for master's level therapists and type in their names. And you can come up with the status of their license. And the <coughs> thing that you most want to see is a clear license. That means there haven't been any lawsuits or any malpractice. Uh, judgments or anything against them. Um, in my case, my license <coughs> is inactive because I'm no longer practicing in California, although I'm still licensed in California. But what you look for is clear. And the same would be true with a psychologist. Uh, in this case, you would go to the website for the Board of Psychology <coughs> and uh, check the licensure there. Now, some teenagers are so depressed that they can't make the best use of talk therapy right away. So, drug therapy and antidepressants may be in order. Now, this is a very controversial thing because um, I'm sure you've seen in the news that um, some teenagers on antidepressants actually get more depressed and some of them actually become suicidal. Now, this isn't really well understood. It may be, again, that if they're really depressed and their mood starts to lift, suicide becomes an option. Uh, or it may be that simply the adolescent brain reacts differently to these chemical components. Uh, nevertheless, studies have found that the SSRIs, particularly things like Prozac, <coughs> in combination with therapy, work very well with depressed teenagers. I think what's important if, if the drug therapy would seem indicated with your daughter, um, work with a medical doctor, a uh, psychiatrist uh, perhaps, who has special knowledge in prescribing these medications for teenagers. Um, also look for tight follow-up. It would be great if the first month or two of taking the medication, he or she could see the doctor every week or every other week just to make sure everything's okay. Um, if the doctor says, I'll see her in six weeks, that's not good enough. Uh, I wouldn't want that to be my doctor. I would want my daughter in there, and I'm sure you would too. Also, be alert to signs. Uh, ask the doctor also about starting at the lowest uh, acceptable dose too, just to cut down on the possibilities of side effects. And also be alert to signs of trouble with antidepressants. If your teenager suddenly starts having suicidal thoughts, uh, panic attacks, <coughs> insomnia, agitation, <coughs> or maybe angry, violent behavior, um, it's time to call the doctor and to wean them off the medication. And um, certainly hospitalization, again, in a suicidal crisis site, hospitalization may be necessary. And there are two other times when hospitalization may be recommended. First, if your teenager has a serious problem with drugs or alcohol, an in-hospital treatment program may be the best way for them to get clean and sober. Also, if your teenager has developed an eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia in conjunction with depression, <coughs> excuse me, um, the intense multidisciplinary uh, uh, program that uh, where these eating disorders are treated uh, would be often best in a hospital. Uh, now, making the best use, we're getting in the homeward stretch here, uh, making the best use of professional health. Except in a suicidal emergency, I talked about taking your teenager to a doctor. And a teenager may be able to hear a recommendation for mental health help better from a doctor, particularly a familiar, trusted doctor, than from you or someone else. 
uh, present therapy to your teenager as an opportunity, not as punishment, and show that you're willing to participate, either directly with family therapy or by your willingness to make changes at home that further the goals of therapy. That's one of the biggest challenges as a therapist in working with teenagers because you can work and work with the teenager, but sometimes the things don't change at home. It's, it can be very frustrating. Insist that your teenager at least try therapy and give it a fair try. Do know that it's not a quick fix, that you know it's not going to be a Woody Allen thing with five sessions a day for 20 years, but it may be some uh, weeks or months. Um, also, approach therapy with realistic expectations. Set some intermediate goals in your own life for your teenager. And uh, again, praise the effort. And again, if you feel the necessity to go to therapy yourself, either as family therapy or individually to deal with your feelings about this, that can really be a help. So in conclusion, please know that you're not alone, that there is hope, and there is help for you and your team to find new ways to reach out to each other and to connect with each other and share all the challenges and joys that life together. Thank you very much, and I hope many questions you might have. certain expectations of them um, to not just say, well, they're depressed, so I'm not going to do any discipline. I think sometimes it can be very reassuring for teenagers to have those limits put. You know, like we're, we're trying to work with this, we're trying to help, we, we want very much for you to feel better. However, you know, you do need <coughs> to be home at a certain hour, you do need to um, treat your brothers and sisters with courtesy, you know, it, it, it's, it can happen in a, a physical illness as well as depression that if people stand back and are afraid to set limits, that um, the teenager can kind of get out of control. And I know this was true when I, I had polio as a young child, and um, my parents really had to steal themselves to discipline me as much as my brother and my sister because uh, my siblings were very aware of any difference, uh, different ways we might be treated. And so for the, the sake of family equilibrium and also uh, just for the sake of the teenager, it's good to, and it is a fine line, you know, it's very hard to know sometimes, but I think uh, certainly to keep expectations to, at some level uh, that they might have been previously. Um, does that help at all? That's, uh, you know, and I think also to talk to the doctor or if you're in family therapy to discuss this within family therapy, you know, what can you expect of your teenager? Because if nothing is expected, then that can be very depressing and it can backslip a great deal because they feel in some ways that, you know, you have no faith in them. You know, it's, it's a tough thing with a parent, you know, you, Sometimes uh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. <laughs> but, uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, have you heard if uh, drugs or ABD have any impact on suicide or acting out? Or you know, I haven't directly. Um, certainly that's very, the drug therapy uh, with ADD is very controversial as well. And um, they can certainly, there can be certainly an acting out component with that. Uh, I don't know if they may add, I haven't seen anything in the literature to indicate that that's been uh, a problem with suicidal behavior or uh, thought, but certainly I think any kind of medication 
um, should be carefully monitored with, the, with kids. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have a comment. Um, our family right now is witnessing the death of a 20-year-old at a party who died from, we're not really sure, but probably OD. Um, and you touched on having friends tell adults if they see their friends in danger. Are you going to speak with the students here about that at all? Or it seems like um, that it, might it, be a really good idea. I would love to do that yeah, at some point. I, mean, um, I think that needs to. So. Yeah, I think there are so many deaths and sorrows that can be prevented from friends keeping an eye on a friend. Yeah, and they, they do it out of love, they do it out of loyalty, but yeah. they need to know that the most loving thing to do is to risk it losing a friendship right. so that you don't lose a friend. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm sorry, I had two questions. Another one. Um, we have a preteen that um, sometimes says, oh, I wish I were dead or oh, I could just kill myself. And then you say to him, um, well, let's go to therapy and we need to, this is not normal. And we're going to take you to therapy if you really feel this way. No, no, I don't know. I'm going to go to therapy. Um, and then he doesn't say it again. Uh -huh. So should you be concerned? So, I, I think it <coughs> should be of some concern. I think that there, there's two things this, you know, but you know your child yeah. best. And so um, if your child tends to overstate things, as a matter of course, it's always done this, then perhaps, you know, you kind of keep an eye on them, but it might not be as serious as somebody who all of a sudden is talking about this. Um, at the same time, if this keeps coming up again and again, um, maybe therapy is indicated, and I, I know quite often kids will be you know, kicking and screaming. They, they think, oh my God, oh, my friends say it, everybody will think I'm crazy and yeah. this is terrible, and you know, what am I going to say to this shrink? Uh, so um, sometimes <coughs> presented as an opportunity, maybe for the family, um, saying something like, well, you know, I'd love to see a therapist because I'm very concerned that these talkings about, you're talking about wanting to be dead and wanting um, to kill yourself or not wanting to live, uh, this seems to come up again and again and it makes me really scared and it makes me very sad. And let's go to a therapist so I can learn to deal with it. Maybe we can talk together and come up with some ideas so you won't feel so bad. And you know, when you, Sometimes a teenager fears being stigmatized and shoveled off to a therapist and uh, they don't see themselves as a problem. And so I think if it, particularly in this case, if you offer to go also and that maybe this is a problem for you too because you are very concerned, that might not, you know, he might be going to help you understand this rather than uh, being taken because you think he's crazy. <clears throat> so, you know, that, that might be helpful. You know, you know, sometimes it's necessary to just insist, well, let's just go see what it's like. <clears throat> yes? You spoke about the, um, the difference between just a normal moody teenager and a teenager who's depressed. What about a teenager who, with certain people, is always, <laughs> but with, at home, is pretty much, <laughs> I mean, can a child who is depressed uh -huh. turn that on, turn on, you know? A child who's depressed, seriously depressed, really can't turn it on and off as easily. They may be a little more up with their friends, but it's much more likely that because the depression really takes over in some ways as a chemical reaction in the brain, uh, not always a, a reaction to an event, um, it's very hard to turn off on and off, particularly when it gets to a certain point. Um, the surliness that uh, parents see quite often as part of the normal moody adolescence, you know, again, when others get the best and you get the worst of your teenagers. So um, it would, you know, something to uh, pay attention to, certainly, um, and maybe address with your teenager if that's possible, but if it seems that, you know, with you, 
the surliness, the, the irritability is unrelenting, then it might be worth checking out, certainly. Yes? With regard to uh, performance anxiety and uh, fear of disappointing your parents, mm -hmm. is there a way other than um, talking about the two perspective and giving just I, I think it's so hard for them to see the future that you know, yes. you know that that A that they didn't get on this exam won't affect them next week or even next year. But is there some other way to give a some perspective with regard to that to bring down that anxiety? Oh I think that's such a good question. And I think that um, you know just expressing love no matter what the outcome and saying that um, you're proud of him or her, you're proud of the effort that they put into it, you know, you worked so hard on it, I know you did, you were so dedicated, rather than, you know, if a person comes in second and isn't, or third or doesn't place in some kind of competition and is used to doing that, or maybe they don't get into the first choice of college, but they uh, get into the second, you know, it's a, a I've often, I, I did part-time work for uh, Northwestern University, which is also my alma mater, but I was a paid admissions officer for 20 years part-time, and I did a lot of interviews at college fairs uh, down in St. Francis um, for many years, and I would uh, do follow-up with kids after, and particularly with kids I'd interviewed, and some of these were just excellent students who did not get in. in fact, Two of the best people I ever interviewed for Northwestern did not get into Northwestern. Went elsewhere and did wonderfully, which was great to see. But, you know, I think it's so good for kids to know that your love and your good regard for them does not hinge on them achieving a certain thing, getting into a certain college. Um, you know, sometimes there's, a, we could do a, a thing in therapy where you know somebody said, oh, if, I, if I don't ace this test, I mean that's just it. And you think, well, what's it? What's going to happen? You know, let's let's think about this reasonably. What will life be like if this doesn't happen? You know, <coughs> life can take some twists and turns, and it, you're right, absolutely right, that it's very hard for them to see beyond today and beyond this year, and to know that a setback or disappointment now may actually be a very positive thing. And so, you know, it's, it's tough, but I think to help them feel valued in so many ways, uh, and to, you know, notice self-criticism, for example, if they feel, you know, I'm either number one or nothing, uh, to find ways to, um, reinforce their, their value as human beings completely apart from what they achieve academically or in sports. And that's that's a challenge. That's huge. May I follow up? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I'm experiencing that the, the anxiety um, uh, has has been brought on by perfectionism. I, I don't know how they relate to each other, but, but I'm certain that mm -hmm. one feeds the other. Oh, yeah. um, and so what I've seen is, and I even encourage this, that I mean, there was a point where the room had to be immaculate before any study could take place. And I even encouraged her, okay, you know what, for two weeks, I don't want you to pick anything up. And months later, now what I'm seeing is complete chaos. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, your environment is a reflection of what's going on in your head. So, and, and I know that. I know that in her head there is there is this incredible amount of anxiety going on, and so she feels she cannot even control her environment or doesn't want to. So even, I mean, there's lots of discussion, there's lots of communication going on. And, and so my question is, I mean, when that, that, that perspective is being given, but it's not being received, or she can't, she can't grasp it, and she can't uh, rationalize it, mm -hmm. what, what that thing would be? Possibly, things that I've seen patients like this, and what um, we can often do is even something physical, <coughs> like, you know, working with her on um, st stress, you know, dealing with stress, like the deep breathing, and you know, when you start to feel this rise, or get her into yoga, or you know, meditation, 
And Thank you for saying that because because I am I'm going down that road now. Uh -huh. We do yoga together, meditation, breathing exercises. Yeah, and that can over time can help a great deal. And those are tools that she can take with her throughout life. And it doesn't demand any perspective beyond the here and now. And I think when she can, you know, get the the relaxation thing going and to. Uh, it, there, quite often, I would in therapy with very anxious patients, and I have people with panic attacks. Anxiety would sometimes make tapes for them with guided imagery and things like that. Some people laugh at that as terribly new agey, and I am probably one of the least new agey people you would ever find. But I truly believe in the value of those things. I've seen them work with patients a great deal, and uh, especially perfectionists. Boy, that's tough. Very tough thing to deal with. Thank you. Sounds like you have a wonderful daughter, but I truly understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. I, I just want to say, as a parent, sometimes it's it's easy to go into denial and say it's not really it's not that bad. Yes. And, and I had to have a doctor say, if I don't put her on medication right now, yes, I would be irresponsible. So yes. I hate when this happened. But anyway, <laughs> I just. It's just really important to to um, to listen because these, they're little things sometimes, and sometimes they like to work in chaos, and sometimes they need help to keep that order. You know, sometimes they just get her to get in order because she says, "Oh, I like it like this," mm -hmm. but I I feel better if it's a little more neat, and I know I I can work in chaos, but I also feel much better when I have the house all straightened up. So it's just teaching them. And it's hard to be objective because us parents, you know, go through our own traumas. Oh, absolutely. And I had surgery, so, you know, that was an impact. So I do think it's important to just listen. And Sister Celeste is always saying to eat with them and say you love them. And she thinks we don't hear that, but, you know, <laughs> it, it, it reminds me because she really responds when I just pat her on the back and say you're doing a good job because the other side is like, oh my God, did you do your history? Are you finished with your algebra? You know, because the anxiety of our anxiety to have them yes. succeed. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's just teaching them just to get through what they need to do. And I think it's really important to listen and I'm not always good at it, you know? Well, none of us are perfect, <laughs> but... Sure. Sure but I think it's important because it's hard to imagine our child needs to be on medication or that they're going through some difficult period that has nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. You know, they have friends, they have boyfriends, you know, all that stuff impacts them, like you said, their first love. Who would imagine that that would be such a strong impact? Uh, problems, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experience. It makes such a difference. Thank you all very much.